Hello, everyone. Hello. Can you all hear me from over here? You can see me, right? So anyway, welcome to Astronomy 102. My name is Yong. I'll be a host for this uh, live broadcast of all things astronomy in, in Singapore as well. And uh, supporting me is Ji Hang from Behind the Scenes, which is uploading to the Facebook Live, and also Li Fei, who hopefully can live cast uh, some of the views from a telescope, okay, from a house around the area. So as you know, right, in this situation with the COVID-19, you can't really go out to actually have a good look at the night sky, or perhaps visit observatory, okay, to kind of look through the telescope or visit the Omni Theater for the live planetarium show. So here's the next best thing. We can actually show you how the sky looks like in Singapore tonight, okay? So, uh, yeah, now, can you see this screen over here? Now, this is the screen as it looks like uh, in Singapore's night sky. And you can see down below, it actually shows you the, what we call the, you know, the directions, okay? The cardinal directions. This is west over here. This is northwest, southwest, and that's north over here. By the way, the software I'm using is called Stellarium. So it is a free software. If you'd like to, you can download it and try it out for free as well. All right, you, I can actually also kind of move around as well to look at different places. So the first place I'm going to concentrate on is somewhere in the western part of the sky. Now, that's the place where the sun will set around nighttime, isn't it? Now, close to the western part of the sky, can you see this very bright star-like object? Now, obviously, you can see what it says, right? It is not a star, it is actually the planet Venus. And it shines with a brilliant light over there. The second brightest object that we can see in the night sky. The brightest will be the moon. The second brightest will be Venus. So I'm going to fly a little bit closer to Venus to have a look over there. Oh, can you see that? It is, a uh, well, it actually only shows kind of like a phase of Venus, not like a whole full circle. Now, that's because Venus as a planet only lights up, right? Because it is reflecting the light from the sun, okay? And it is closer to the sun than Earth, so kind of always shows a face, kind of like how the moon usually looks like. Of course, uh, sometimes it does get almost like a full Venus as well. So do try to look out for Venus if you can. It's going to be visible for the next couple of weeks, actually. All right, so that's Venus in the western part of the sky. Now, the next group of stars we'll be looking at is right over here. Now, stars by themselves, it's kind of hard to kind of differentiate one star from the other, okay? So what do people do? They draw lines between the stars to form a particular shape and pattern called a constellation. Now, this group of stars over here, right, with these three stars that forms a line over here. Uh, now, this one is called the constellation of Orion. Orion the hunter. And obviously, these three stars over here is called Orion's belt. Now, the thing about Orion is it has got quite a lot of distinctive stars within it. It's super bright as well. So you can see that one of the stars over here is called Betelgeuse, and alternate on the other side over here is this one is called Rigel. Okay, now the thing is, hopefully, tonight, so if the sky is clear, we might be able to look at Rigel, but it is actually a double star. So, to our naked eye, it looks like there's a single star over here, but in actual fact, there's a double star over here. And Betelgeuse, which looks like a yellowish colored star, is actually a super red giant star, hyper giant red star, actually. So, uh, hopefully, we can actually try to look out for Rigel. Now, close to the belt of Orion, down over here, if you look over there, there is the sword of Orion, okay, sheathed on his belt over here. Now, tonight, once again, right, we might try to look out for this weird-looking thing over here. You can see, right, it's a bit like a glowy, sort of like moldy, okay, like a gassy thing over there. I'm going to fly a little bit closer to have a look over there. Now, do you see that? What do you think is this one? It looks like a giant gas cloud over there, isn't it? So, and you will be correct, it is a giant gas cloud. In a scientific term, right, we will call this a nebula, like a giant gas cloud flying 24 light years across, or perhaps it's 26 light years across. Giant gas clouds form from hydrogen gas. And you can see, right, within these gas clouds are very newborn stars because a nebula is where newborn stars are actually formed. So some people like to call this the nursery for stars. So we can see, whoa, quite a nice looking group of stars over here. So for example, our sun was formed in a nebula such as this billions of years ago. And over the next billions of years, it kind of slowly drifts apart from each other. So all these stars are slowly drift, well, not slowly, very quickly flying away from each other, distributing themselves in different corners of the galaxies. All right, so that's the Orion Nebula. So maybe later Li Fei might look at it, but it's hard to say because it is actually very low on horizon as well. So 
All right, so that is the Orion constellation over here. Now, of course, uh, besides uh, looking at uh, Orion over here, if you follow the belt of Orion forward doo -doo 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 down over here, can you see that? Can you see this bright looking star over here? So it is very rare that, you know, constellation kind of guides you to find other constellation. But if you follow this line downwards towards the west downwards, it points to this star here called Aldebaran and is part of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. But, and if you follow the belts of uh, Orion backwards, down over here, can you see that? It lines up actually to point to the brightest star that you can see in the night sky. It's called Sirius. And I'm very, very serious about that, okay? So I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer to Sirius. Now, Sirius is known among different cultures. For example, among the Greeks, this is known as the dog star. And to the Egyptian, this was the star sacred to the goddess Isis as well. But nowadays, we more recognize Sirius as the constellation of a Canis Major or the Big Dog. Can you see that? All right, so if you join the line between them, it actually forms like a, uh, like a big dog in the sky. So that's the front legs, that's the back legs, and that's the tail of that. And Sirius is somewhere right between the heart of this Canis Major. All right, now, of course, uh, later tonight, right, we also hope to look for some of the star clusters within Sirius as well. So nearby the star Sirius, down right over here, there's a cluster of stars, okay, over here. See that? Now this one, this group of stars over here was once again formed within a uh, nebula actually, and this is called the Beehive Cluster, right over here. Oh no, not the Beehive, this is like the, what is it, the little Beehive Cluster right over here. Okay, it's just right within a uh, tennis major over here. All right, so hopefully maybe we can actually look at it through the telescope, or if not, right, we might also look at all these things through uh, images captured a few days before or within the telescope in the observatory. So most of it is actually using uh, resources from the Science Center, of course. All right, so I'm going to zoom a little bit further away, Canis Major, see that? Now, of course, right above here, ta -da, we have the little dog, okay, or Canis Minor, but the star over here is called Procyon. Okay, I was told that it was not called Procyon, which I usually call it, but rather Procyon. All right, now, of course, like Canis Minor is a little bit more of a boring constellation because there's just two stars in it, just forming one straight line over here. All right, so can you see that? I'm going to turn off the constellation line. Now, just by identifying where Orion is, right, the three stars, you can find Aldebaran right over here. And of course, you can find Sirius, okay, behind, right over here, which of course is Canis Major. And here we have Procyon and or Canis Minor over here. Now, following up over here, we have got these two stars. Can you see that? Now, these two stars, right, form the constellation of Gemini the Twin. So I'm going to turn on the constellation line. This one is called Pollux, and this one is called Castor. All right, so you can see, right, by finding out where one constellation is, you can find other constellations around here. So tonight, if you can just go out, and, and if the sky is clear, right, Perhaps you can try to look for some of these constellations. Okay, let's turn off the constellation once again. Now, of course, like, this is just the stars, the constellation belonging in the western part of the sky. Now, throughout the night, right, you probably noticed that they will kind of go down lower and lower and lower down the western part of the sky. Can you see that? Because stars, right, they don't really move, but Earth is spinning on its axis. So all the stars, the planets, and the moon will appear to move or shift from east towards west. All right, but of course, this is not the only thing out there because slightly high up over here, can you see that? All right, now this is an interesting one. So one of the brightest stars within this constellation over here, and uh, this is the one I believe is called Regulus. One, two, three, four. Now it's a little bit hard to see in Singapore's night sky, but Regulus is a pretty bright one. I'm gonna zoom in a bit closer and let, let's turn on the constellation line over here. Oh. What does it look like? Does it look like a mouse? This is the nose of the mouse. That's the tail of the mouse over here. Nah, it's not a mouse, okay? This is supposed to represent uh, Leo the lion. Yeah, well, I bet you wouldn't think there was Leo the lion just by looking at the shape over here. So whenever we look at constellations, sometimes we require a little bit of imagination. 
All right, now some of the things that we're looking at tonight, right, if not using the telescope, the live casting of telescope, is uh, some of the images taken from a few uh, days ago. But this is, by the way, is a very hard constellation to make out in Singapore. But it looks, what do you think is this constellation? Like a Y join on each end, isn't it? But it's supposed to represent cancer, the crab. But a long time ago, more than 2,000 years ago, there was an astronomer called Ptolemy. He looked at cancer, the crab, and he was able to recognize that somewhere within the heart of cancer, there's this anomalous mass of stars, okay? So this is once again another star cluster. All right. This star cluster, however, is called the Beehive Cluster. So the one somewhere down below at Leo the Lion, uh, somewhere at the Canis Major, that one's the Little Beehive. Now this one, near the Cancer the Crab, is called the Beehive Cluster. Uh, now this one is a much bigger cluster of stars over here. I'm going to zoom in slightly further away from Cancer the Crab over here, and let's have a look at other things. All right, so that's the western part of the sky. We have got Leo the Lion up there in right above our head, and then we have Cancer the Crab as well. Now let's have a look at the west. Uh, let's have a look at the southern part of the sky. Okay, so I'm just going to slowly zoom over here, to, 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 over here. All right, now we have the brightest star, which is called Sirius. Now let's have a look at the second brightest star, which is Canopus. This is the one. Canopus is the second brightest star in the, in the night sky. And it's uh, actually part of a very, very large constellation as well. Part of uh, the Carina over here. Okay, let's turn on the constellation labels. Ah, the Canopus over here. It's part of this Carina thing. Now this one is supposed to represent the boat. Now, a long time ago, right, the Greeks have this uh, sailboat called the Argo. Have you heard of that before in Jason and the Argo knot? So this one is supposed to represent that boat over here. And Canopus in the story, right? Well, actually, it's supposed to be a navigator of the king of uh, Sparta, Menelaus. And he's supposed to send and bring his king, right, to fight in the Battle of Troy. So that is Canopus over here, the second brightest star that we can see in the night sky. Let's have a look over here. Now, tonight, right, Li Fei is hopefully going to show us a very interesting star cluster as well. Well, not a star cluster, but rather right, another nebula right over here. That's the Carina Nebula over here. So remember, this is the boat, and this is the back side of the boat over here. And there it is. That is the Carina Nebula over here. It's one of the larger nebula that we can see in the night sky. And it's the southern part of the sky as well. Very nice look at right? Yeah, it's a very big one. So this, uh, there's one star wind here. There's a all the stars have been here are actually very, very big and very bright as well. Okay, zooming out away from Carina. Let's turn on the constellation line. Now, the southern part of the sky, right, is going to be a little bit better, okay, as we reach the midpoint of the year, around June, July, and August, because uh, we can see, start to see the southern cross, Centaurus, and all these things as well. So here is the southern part of the sky. So just think about you turning your head to look towards the south. Now this one, what do you think it looks like? It's called the crux, okay? And it supposed represents the Southern Cross. Have you noticed that when you look at the flag of Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, you all notice that this bunch of stars on your flag, right? Now this is supposed to be those group of stars, okay? So the Southern Cross are the stars that you can see only in the southern part of the world in countries living in the Southern Hemisphere, or in Singapore, which is somewhere along the equator as well. So that is the Southern Cross. Now, within the Southern Cross, this is one of my favorite cluster of stars over here. It's sometimes called the Jewel Box, right over here. You see this star called Mimosa over here? As I zoom in a little bit closer, there's this small little cluster of stars that looks like a capital letter A. Might be a bit hard to see, but if you have a telescope, and if you aim it right around this corner, you see these clustered up stars. Now, one very interesting or one nice thing about these, uh, the jewel box star cluster is within this cluster, the stars, right, have red giant stars, they have newborn bluish colored stars. So to our eyes, right, it looks like a box of jewels over there. So very, very beautiful to look at. Of course, like, to see the A-shape, you need to be a bit further away. When you get close up, you see, oh, there's a lot of stars over here. All right, that's a cool one. All right, now that's the southern part of the stars, uh, of the sky. 
All right, now let's have a look at the north. The north is also very good to look at sometimes. So right now at this time of the year, which is uh, April and coming to May, right, we have the, oh, this one. Let's turn off the line over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You all know what is this group of stars over here? Well, this one is called the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper isn't really a constellation as such. It's sort of like a sub-constellation because rightfully the Big Dipper is part of the constellation of Ursa Major or the Big Bear right over here. See that? That's the Big Bear over here. And of course, la, that's the tail end over here. Now, the good thing about the Big Dipper is it's supposed to point towards the North Pole. Can you see that? Just by finding out where the Big Dipper is, you can use it to find your direction. So it points towards the North over here. Ah, And of course, la, the, the North Star of Polaris, which is down below, is part of the constellation of Ursa Minor or the little bear up here. All right, so tonight, if you can happen to be outdoors, okay, maybe to do a bit of jogging or something, and if the sky just happens to be a little clearer, try to look out for some of this constellation. Ursa Major, we have the Big Dipper, try to look out for Venus if you can. Yes, and down over here, we have another weird looking, well, constellation as well. So in Singapore, most of the stars within this constellation is really not visible. But this one is, okay, it's called Arcturus. In Singapore's night sky, it is super bright. Arcturus doesn't look like a boot. I think it looks a little bit like a kite, okay? Does it look like a kite? Yes. So tonight, if we can, we might try to look out for Arcturus as well, although it might be a bit too low for us to see. But it is also a very, very interesting and bright constellation to look at. So besides that, some of the other brighter stars that we can see is right over here somewhere within the eastern part of the sky and this one is part of the constellation of virgo this one this star is called spica yes it's a very strange name i know spica right over here virgo in the story is supposed to represent the goddess ceres you know the one that kind of harvests the crops and spreads cereal so i suppose she might represent the mother earth in some sense and down over here once again we have reached the southern part of the sky. So remember what's this? That's the southern cross, isn't it? So the southern cross is described by a bigger constellation right over here. So it is somewhere down, well, kind of under it actually. So this whole thing is on top of the southern cross. This one is uh, the constellation of Centaurus. Now, I always like Centaurus because uh, it is a very big constellation and it looks super cool, almost like a real animal. It's one of those half man, half horse mythological character, okay? And one of the stars in his front hoof, right over here, of course, at 8 p.m., it will be too low for us to see. But this one is called uh, Rigel Cantorus. And uh, if, looking at it, you can only see uh, one star. But if you use a powerful telescope, you see there's really two stars over there. Two stars, okay? And uh, if you have a very, very powerful telescope, even more powerful than the one you use, you see that. That's three stars a minute. So this is a trinary star system. And one of the stars within it called the Proxima Centauri is the closest star to Earth. So uh, yeah, it's around 4.3 light years away from Earth. Yes, that's, that's pretty close towards us actually. All right, so that's a little bit about the night sky. Now if that's right, I'm gonna zoom in out slightly and just give you what we call the dome view of the night sky. Now how many, how many constellations do you think there is total in the night sky? How many? Well, there's around 88 constellations in the night sky. And if you count all of them right now, one, two, three, four, you come to probably around 40 of them. You can't see all of them, okay? You have to wait another year for it to all go down and a new group of stars will come up once again, okay? So yeah, all right. So hopefully, right, you enjoy a little bit about this uh, constellation, the stories and all these things. But uh, I cannot keep on talking about all this things that we can see because right for our next session we have our very special okay our colleague over there Li Fei she's a she has a telescope oh the weather is not very good unfortunately okay it's slightly cloudy but like I've said right we have prepared a special set of uh, images taken from uh, a few days ago of some of these uh, specific constellations and stars and uh, you know nebulas and star clusters as well all right and so that's right I think I'll switch over to a uh, to Li Fei's side, okay, where we, are, we can actually try to show you 
some of those uh, very interesting uh, objects. All right, so passing it on to you. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Okay, the, the night sky is uh, pretty cloudy out there, as you might not know, right? It's raining. Okay, so we can't actually have a live cast of any real, you know, astronomical object. So we have returned back towards Stellarium, okay, and of course with me as well. And let's look at the night sky, okay? So I pretty much talk about uh, most of the objects that you can see in the night sky as well. But here's the question. What are stars? What are stars? Well, in a way, right, stars are one of the most elemental objects in our universe, okay? They are actually formed from hydrogen gas. Now, you know, our solar system, our, our universe was formed billions of years ago, 14.3 billions of years ago, perhaps, uh, out of, uh, and the first element that comes out of it is hydrogen gas. And in a way, right, stars are formed from giant balls of hydrogen gases. So our sun is formed from a hydrogen gas, Sirius is formed from hydrogen gas, Canopus and all the other stars out there as well. So in a very strange way, right, all the other elements in our universe or, or complex elements like iron, calcium, all these were formed within the heart of the stars, okay? So next time someone tells you that we are formed from stardust, you better believe it, we are formed from the leftover elements of stars, okay? All right, so remember what, what we saw just now, actually. Oh, yes, we saw some nebulas as well, okay? So usually nebulas, because they are mostly formed from giant hydrogen gas clouds, that's where many of those uh, places where stars are formed. So once again, right, I've returned back towards the uh, Orion Nebula again. So there it is, okay? So I believe this group of stars over here is called the Trapezium. Ah, very nice to look at. So that is a giant gas cloud that lies around 24, 26 light years across. That's huge, okay? And lots of gas over there, lots of uh, leftover minerals, iron, uranium, gold, and all these things. That eventually they coalesce, drawn together by its own gravity, forming itself, condensing, fusing to form in themselves into stars, okay? Big stars, small stars, medium-sized stars. All right, so that's Orion Nebula that we saw just now. And it's, of course, a very, very good nebula as well. Oh yes, by the way, right, I have, a, I have a comment actually, I just read, I didn't know about this, but these three stars within the belt of Orion, Elnitak, Elnilam, and Mintaka, they are sometimes known as the Three Sisters or the Three Kings. So I believe these are, it is uh, once again an asterism, okay, of the constellation of Orion. So remember, just now we look at the Big Dipper, remember, the Big Dipper was an asterism, wasn't it? Sort of like a sub-constellation of a uh, Ursa Major. Now, right over here, we have got this character over here, Bellatrix. Anyone remember Bellatrix from Harry Potter? Yeah, that's a Bellatrix over here. So, well, she, I think they use a lot of, uh, how to say, the names of stars as characters, okay, in the stories. For example, remember there's another character over here, Sirius. Yeah, Sirius. What, what was the name again? Sirius Black, wasn't it? And what kind of animal does Sirius change into? It changes into a dog, okay? And uh, not just any dog, it's a black dog, isn't it? So quite appropriate given that Sirius is sometimes called the, how to say, the dog star. Okay, so there's a lot of very interesting things to see about the astronomy over here. So, ah, yes, somewhere around Sirius. Let's turn on the constellation to make it easier for us to find. We have the little beehive cluster right over here. So remember, this is a nice cluster of stars I think just now we use inside the slideshows. So within this uh, little beehive cluster or M41, lots of nice looking stars over here. Now usually, of course, we kind of can't really get to such details, but in fact, we can really zoom in. But I have to say, right, these are just simply pixels, so they do not truly reflect the, the, how the stars would really look like in real life. So as I zoom in, you can see it doesn't start to look as well if I zoom in too much. So I'm going to zoom out to give the illusion of, you know, how well it looks like. All right, so that's a little beehive clusters. I remember these stars were formed in a nebula a long time ago. And right now they're trying to split apart, traveling away from each other. Now some of these clusters, right, are thousands of light years away from us. So when we talk about, you know, stars being thousands of light years away from Earth, what does it actually mean? Well, the thing is, light takes time to travel. And we are actually saying that the light from those distant stars takes a thousand years to travel all the way from this star cluster down towards us. So any change right, that we see within those clusters of stars 
occurred thousands of years ago. So there is no, how to say, real time, okay? We do not have real time communication with stars that are light years away from us. So that is one of the interesting things about the universe, okay? That things do not occur simultaneously for us to be able to observe them happening. So that's a little beehive cluster, remember that? Okay, somewhere been Sirius over here, and somewhere between Sirius and uh, and Procyon, okay, Procyon, okay. There is also the N50 as well, the heart shaped, uh, what, well, how to say, heart shaped cluster. Now it's a little bit hard for you to find a heart shaped cluster, okay. And so I'm going to use my program over here. I'm going to put N50 just to tell me where it is. Uh, there it is, okay. That's N50, the heart shaped cluster somewhere between Sirius and Procyon, right over here. Can you see that? And there it is. Now, to my eyes, right, it doesn't really particularly look like a heart, okay? It contains uh, thousands of this one example of an open cluster as well. And in, usually in uh, open clusters of stars, it contains uh, thousands of stars, okay, up to a thousand stars over here. And once again, right, you can see that uh, if I zoom in too much, it kind of breaks the illusion. So I'm going to travel further away. This one, by the way, is roughly around 3,000 light years away from us. So events that occur within the heart-shaped cluster happened 3,000 years ago. And we are only just observing what happens over there. All right, so that's the heart-shaped cluster. And how can we find... Oh, oh, yes, I remember that. One of the very nice-looking clusters right over here within the constellation of Cancer, the Crab. Now, unfortunately, Cancer the Crab can be very hard for us to find in Singapore because the constellation is not very, very bright. But yes, by using this magic over here, I can see where it is. There it is. And it appears as an anomalous a blob over here within the heart of Cancer the Crab. And it was uh, observed more than 2,000 years ago originally by the Greek uh, kind of uh, astronomer Ptolemy, actually, more than uh, 2,000 years ago in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. All right, now I'm going to try to, oh, oh sorry, trying to find a search for beehive cluster, just to make sure that I've got the right one. You know, you just need to be confident sometimes. Ah, there it is. And it's about 500, 577 light years away, by the way. So by comparison, it is a relatively close cluster of stars over here. Quite nice looking, right? I remember last time when I operated the observatory, we had the TASOS member, that's the Astronomical Society of Singapore. They tend to like to look for the beehive cluster whenever it is visible. I never was very interested in the beehive cluster, unfortunately. All right. Okay, once again, right, let's look towards the southwestern part of the sky, okay? Ta da! Now, Right now, we are looking at the southern part of the sky or the southwestern part of the sky. And the one that I'm interested in looking for is, uh, yeah, Carina Nebula. Now, just now, right, we look at Orion Nebula and I say it was one of the best looking nebula in the night sky. Now, Carina Nebula is supposed to be pretty good to look at as well. And it's somewhere near the backside of uh, this giant constellation, which is the Argos. Remember that? That's the boat over here. The Canopus, which is one of the brightest stars in the night sky, well, second brightest star in the night sky. So, Carina is somewhere near the backside over here. Right over here. And I will say, right, that Carina is probably a bigger constellation, well, bigger nebula. By that, I mean it occupies a larger area of the sky. So, you can see it looks bigger by, by the, compared to the nebula, Orion nebula, but maybe it isn't as bright, okay? It never seems to really look as bright as the Orion Nebula, but looks pretty good actually from here. And there's the stars within the Carina Nebula as well. Quite nice looking. And of course, la, after that, we have the Jewel Box, okay? And the Jewel Box, like I've said earlier, is one of my favorite constellation. Well, not constellation, but cluster of stars. Now, these objects that we're looking at just now, these are what we call the, well, deep sky object objects that you usually need the telescope to look at. So right over here, that's the, that's the jewel box that looks like a letter A, like capital letter A. And there it is, okay? That is the jewel box. 
And like I said, it contains a lot of different kinds of stars, not just one singular young born stars. It has got older stars. It's got red giant stars. So that's why it always appears right, to have different colors, reddish, bluish, and sometimes even greenish, okay? All right, so there it is, okay? These are deep sky objects that we hope to look at tonight if the sky was clearer and it was not raining as well. And today, right, the date is uh, oh, around, uh, yeah, 24th of April, okay? So let's have a look further away from the night sky. Zoom out a bit further away. Do you think the sky will look like the same tomorrow? night at the same time what do you think well why do we find out okay using our astronomy software okay this uh stellarium so i'm going to change the date to 25th of april oh slightly different isn't it by the way do you notice that the stars slightly shift towards the west all right let's try it once again oh it's all moving from east to west isn't it interesting okay is it actually the stars are really moving of course not, right? Now, you have to remember, right, that even though Earth is spinning on its axis, giving us the day and night cycle, and that is mostly the reason why the stars appear to move from east to west. There's also another reason for the stars moving. That is because Earth is orbiting around the sun, okay? Yes, as Earth orbits around the sun, right, the stars, the planets, all will appear to shift from east towards west as well. So let's, ooh, Oh, let's see. Okay, that's uh, I wanted to look at the western part of the sky and kind of move too much over here. Let's have a look at the west part, western part of the sky. By the way, you notice that Orion has almost gone down the western part of the sky, and that's May, by the way. Bye bye, Orion. Bye bye. And when Orion finally sinks down the western part of the sky, a new group of stars comes from the from the east. Okay, now this one is a pretty good one, actually. It's one of my favorites. Oh, that's north, okay. That's uh, east over here. Uh, it's a bit more towards the south, okay. Down over here. And let's turn on the constellation line over here. Oh, it's down over here, okay. It's still not fully up. That means Orion is still only halfway down. Let's, ah, let's let, let the moon go down so it gets super bright. Okay, now the one I'm talking about is this one. You see that? It looks almost like a little J shape over here, right? Let's turn on the constellation line over here. See that? Now I was doing my plantrum, uh, live plantrum shows, right? And when I asked my students, what does it look like? And you know what they tell me it looks like? They say it looks like Maui's hook from Moana. Because yeah, there was there was a recent movie, okay? And I said, no, this is not Moana, sir. not Maui's hook. This is actually uh the constellation of scorpius the scorpion okay but later i had to i had to go and read about it and yes for the polynesian scorpius actually represents uh maui's hook by the way maui is supposed to is supposed to be a demigod okay and he does a lot of mighty deeds and all this thing and this is maui's hook or scorpius so once again right you can see different cultures have different uh ways of looking at the night sky and constellations as well so this is, by the way, in June, okay? So let's go a little bit later. Let's go a bit later in the day. The... And it gets later and later, right? Around uh, June, July. That's when we start to see some of the interesting planets coming up. So around the months of uh, July as well, right? Of course, around 8 p.m., we have uh, planets coming up over here as well. Do you see that? What is this planet over here? Oh, you can see that this is the biggest planet in our solar system, can't you? This is uh, Jupiter representing the king of the gods, okay? So let's center Jupiter and let's fly a little bit closer. So hopefully, right, uh, by July, we have this COVID-19 situation ending, right? And we can have a look at this mighty planet. Very nice to look at. Ooh, look at that. Oh, by the way, do you notice that this Jupiter has got this bunch of uh, weird-looking things around it, like Io, Ganymede, and Callisto? And technically, we are supposed to have Europa as well, okay, which is... These are, by the way, some of the moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has got multiple moons. Oh, for some reason, Europa is not being shown. 
All right, so that is supposed to be Jupiter, we have Io, we have a uh, supposed to have Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So that is Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. And of course, we have Saturn as well. I'm a little bit worried about looking at Saturn because I know in the Stellarium, it doesn't represent Saturn as well as it should. But anyway, let's fly down to Saturn as well. Let's have a closer look. Oh, perhaps my version of Stellarium is a better one and it shows the ring of Saturn, okay? So we have the planet Saturn as well and we have Jupiter. So the month of July is definitely a good one for astronomy because we have a lot of interesting things to see. We have got Jupiter and we also have Saturn as well. Somewhere almost uh, occupying the same area. Now, if all the planets were together as one, right, we tend to call it a conjunction, okay? As they line up in a straight line. Of course, like, this one is almost, but not really conjunction. Okay, now let's have a look at the uh, Scorpius once again. Scorpius, okay, the arch nemesis of Orion. If you don't know already, right, they are supposed to be enemies, okay? So let's remove the constellation line and let's remove the atmosphere. Wow. All right, so, uh, wow, this is a very nice way to look at, isn't it? So Scorpius, of course, is almost shaped like a capital letter J like that. And somewhere within Scorpius is the heart of Scorpius called Antares. And Antares is a very, very, very large super red star actually. It is a red super giant star. All right, I'm going to zoom out further away. Now, the Greek gods, right, supposedly to prevent uh, Antares, uh, Scorpius, from uh, trying to find trouble again with Orion, they actually supposedly set two bodyguards on uh on scorpius the first bodyguard of course is centaurus you all remember centaurus over here we talked about centaurus earlier of course centaurus is one of those half men half horse mythological character aimed with a spear aimed right at the heart of scorpius and one of the stars over here is alpha centauri remember tree is a trinary star system and he bestrides the southern cross and the other bodyguard is well Sagittarius right over here and you see that Sagittarius another half man half horse mythological character but this time around this guy is armed with a bow and arrow instead aimed right at the heart of Scorpius so it looks like Scorpius is not a favorite of anybody okay got two person uh, threatening him with both spears and arrow and like I've said earlier there's a total of around 88 constellations in the night sky and yes you cannot see all the constellation in one single go you need to wait for time for the stars to move from east towards west yes and there it is remember oops we have leo the lion going down in the in the west over here if you remember leo the lion and we have virgo over here we have Bootis. that's Bootis, by the way yeah and this strange looking uh frog like guy who do you think he is it looks like he has got a couple of snakes, okay, surrounding him. What do you think is that? Which character has got snake around him? It looks like he's got multiple heads as well, okay? Maybe it's a seven-headed snake. Now, if you're guessing it is Hercules, okay, you'll be correct, okay? Hercules is one of the more, how to say, uh, there's a lot of depiction about Hercules in the night sky, about constellations. So there's Hercules. There's also a Hydra. There is also like a Leo the Lion is supposed to represent the Nemean, Nemean lion, part of his labors, right? The labors of Hercules. And yeah, lots of things. That's the Hydra over here as well. And over here, we have Corvus the Crow. And Virgo is supposed to represent the goddess Ceres. By the way, I, I remember, I didn't mention what is supposed to be the constellation of Bootis, isn't it? We talk about Bootis just now. Near, it is near the, how to say, the Big Dipper. Now this one, is sometimes called the plowman, okay? Bootis is supposed to represent the plowman. Someone, you know, like digging up, you know, like farming and all these things over there. So there it is. That's the booties over there. Okay. Lots of interesting things to see. All right. I think right from here, right, it's almost time for us to begin our next part of our... Yeah, to have a look at the... How's the night sky tonight? Do you very bad. All right, so we're going to continue on the slideshow, okay? 
So I hope maybe I can give a bit of comments about some of those things. All right, if we can as well. All right, so moving on towards the slideshow. It looks like uh, you haven't lost me just yet, okay? So, like I said previously, the night sky is uh, very poor, okay? It might be raining or cloudy, but you can't really see the constellations or nebula such as that. By the way, do you notice that the Orion Nebula over here looks a bit too, too, too good to be true, right? So how do they actually get an Orion Nebula that looks like that? Well, it's actually taken after a very, very long exposure, okay? 115 shots of 6 seconds. So after that, they might stack the images over there and try to color correct it and get a better image such as that. So that is a one way we do uh, astronomy photography as well, to have long exposure or perhaps to do a bit of color recoloring of it as well. The human eye is not really that sensitive to light as you might think. So when you see, right, Orion Nebula with your own naked eye, to our eyes, it simply looks like just a gray blobbish area over there. Yeah, so this uh, image, by the way, was taken in uh, Malaysia, if you don't know already. So you might be curious, okay, where is a good place to do astronomy in Sing Singapore? Where is a good place to do astronomy in Singapore? Now, usually I advise if you want to do astronomy in Singapore, you might want to, uh, let's say, oh, we can come to Singapore Observ uh, Science Centre Observatory, for example. We used to open every Friday night, so it's closed now because of the COVID-19 situation but it will open up once again, okay? Once it's opened up, do join us, okay, for, for astronomy and observatory. And from there, you can learn more about whether you truly enjoy the, the, the hobby, where to look at for some of the more interesting astronomical object and things like that. And now what we're looking at, ah, we are looking at the B44 Beehive Cluster. So remember the Beehive Cluster was uh, found somewhere within what? Yeah, the constellation of Cancer, the crab, wasn't it? So the Cancer the Crab is a, well, I mean, it's a very faint constellation from Singapore, but it was actually uh, first observed thousands of years ago by this uh, Greek astronomer named Ptolemy, actually. So he, would, he used to live in uh, Alexandria, that's a city in Egypt, a new city. And uh, some people like to call him uh, the father of, you know, ancient astronomy, because uh, he used to be one of those, uh, you know, figurehead, a uh, big guy in astronomy. And he saw within the, the heart, they call it the breast of cancer. He saw this anomalous bunch of stars over there. And he said, oh, look at that. I can see this bunch of stars over there. Now, later, there was a, another astronomer somewhere during the Renaissance. Okay, I think that was like a much later, about 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei. You might have heard of him before. Now, he is quite a different kind of astronomer because he built a telescope, okay? He was not the first person who built a telescope, but rather the second person to actually build a telescope. He built a telescope. Now, the first thing he tried to look at was at, at the planet Jupiter. And he looked at Jupiter and he said, oh, no, I can see there's these uh, four things going around Jupiter. Okay, And it seems to be moving. 
and he discovered the moons of Jupiter. But one of the objects he looked at was at the B44 Beehive Cluster, and he was able to identify 40 distinctive stars, actually, within the Beehive Clusters. Nowadays, of course, can you count more than 40 stars over there? I think there might be more than 40 stars, okay, right within here. Of course, uh, nowadays, we have a much better class of telescope than he had in those days. So, actually, I'm very curious. Galileo Galilei looking at Jupiter and seeing the four, you know, Galilean moons. I mean, maybe in those days, the light pollution was much better in those days. I don't know. I think so. It has to be, right? So in Singapore, when we look at Jupiter, sometimes we don't even see as well as Galileo Galilei. Like I say, the Beehive Cluster is 40 stars a minute. It's around 600 light years, uh, approximately at least from Earth. Still pretty far away from us. No, I will stay over here. And if something interesting come out, I can comment on it as well. And then we have a M41, Little Beehive Cluster. Now, Little Beehive Cluster is, of course, somewhere near Canis Major, okay, near Sirius over there. So it's roughly around 2,300 light years away from Earth. Like I've said, right, pretty far away from us. So when I say that, 2,300 light years, it means, right, it takes the light from that cluster of stars 2,000 over years to travel all the way down towards Earth. And it's roughly around 26 light years across. So it's pretty big, okay? So of course, like, I mean, these are stars, right? And they're still traveling further away from each other. So it was possibly, right, this little beehive cluster was possibly first uh, observed by this uh, Greek philosopher named Aristotle around 300 BC. So uh, like I've said, right, I suppose in those days, the light pollution must be, uh, well, must be much better the situation in those days for, for these people hundreds of uh, thousands of years ago just to see with just their own naked eye. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Nowadays, we need to use a telescope to look at all these uh, deep sky objects. Of course, uh, generally, clusters of stars contain uh, thousands of stars within them. And 50 heart-shaped cluster. Hello. Oh, looks like you haven't lost me just yet, okay? And uh, what we're we looking at? The M50 heart-shaped cluster, okay? So this is the cluster of stars that's found between uh, you know, Procyon and somewhere near Sirius as well. So it is also a cluster of stars, okay, around 3,000 light years away from Earth. So it's technically within the constellation of Monosaurus, the unicorn, by the way. So you might say, what? I didn't know there's a constellation of a unicorn. Well, there is, okay, but except they call it Monosaurus. By the way, Monoceros means one horn, okay? And this cluster of stars, right, is around 12 light years across. So it isn't the biggest of, uh, isn't the biggest of how to say, clusters. And it's uh, roughly around 508 confirmed stars within it as well. Hello, all right, now we're looking at one of the more spectacular looking nebulas within our Milky Way galaxy, okay? The Eta Carina Nebula. So like I've said, it's somewhere near the back side of the Argos, and it's a pretty large nebula as well, okay? So it is uh, roughly around 7,500 light years away from Earth, so it is still pretty far away from us, and it contains this uh, super hypergiant star within it called Ather Carina as well. So, and it's a star which is, by the way, 4 million times brighter than our sun, okay? Yes. So most spec significant of all, of course, Carina, the nebula as well, is contained within this uh, constellation nearby, has got this star called Canopus, which is the second brightest star within the night sky. So definitely, right, this is one of the more spectacular nebula that belongs to the southern part of the sky. So you might say, oh, is it so good? Well, like I've said earlier, this is probably taken after a long exposure. So it says it's taken in 450 shots, okay, of eight seconds. After a long exposure, you know, your instrument your senses can actually measure a much better and bright image and so that's how they produce such a bright and colorful object as well okay and of course we have the beautiful jewel box one of my favorite deep sky objects okay found within the southern cross near the star called mimosa and of course you can see right over here the real thing okay and the brightness and the beautiful stars within this cluster very very nice to look at definitely now, of course, uh, the jewel box is, uh, unfortunately, you need a telescope to look at it. Yeah, unfortunately, that is true. You can't really use your naked eye to kind of uh, 
you might be able to spot it in Singapore's night sky. It's roughly around 6,400 uh, 6, light years away from Earth, okay? And it's got many, many beautiful different colors. So it's sort of like a lower down below the mimosa, the stars within the, the crux. So it's only got four stars in it, right? Within the crux, so it should be easy to see. It's just a cross and somewhere down below on one part of the cross over there, okay? Now it looks like, right, the, the night sky doesn't promise to be very good tonight, okay? So, yep, hopefully, right, so with that, right, you can learn a little bit about astronomy in Singapore, some of the more bright objects in the night sky that you can see. So if you're interested in learning more about astronomy in Singapore, well, this uh, coming uh, next, this coming Thursday, around 30th of April, we have uh, this broadcast as well, okay, from uh, Science Center in the same Facebook page as well. It's a uh, asteroids and beyond at around 4.30 p.m. So if you're interested in space rock, you should definitely come and look for us over there then. Also, right, uh, at the, since it is uh, May Day, 30th of April, we also have an 8 p.m. actually uh, broadcast as well about the night sky. So we're going to set up a telescope to have a live casting of whatever astronomic object we can find from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. So uh, do join us, okay, for 30th of April. We have these two events. The first one is uh, we have the Asteroid and Beyond broadcast at 4.30 p.m. And later at around 8 p.m., we also have a, a live casting of the telescope to look at the night sky. And that's not just to shout out as well to our Friday evening, okay? At 8 p.m., we have to say yes. They're also very interested in astronomy, and they're also, they are also doing a broadcast about astronomy as well, about what we can see at night. So it is a Say Yes, the Singapore Association of Young Sci uh, Engineers and Scientists. S-A-Y-E-S. -E That's their Facebook page. Come and look for it, okay? So they do a broadcast every Friday evening at 8 p.m. as well. And so if that's right, we have almost come to the end of our program as well. So to end off, all right, I have to ask you all to stay home, stay safe, and always look to the sky, okay? All right, bye-bye.